Stan Jibalisco here, continuing our tutorial in regards to the book Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics, published by McGraw-Hill in October of 2013. That's the third edition, edited and revised by yours truly. In the previous video, I talked about wires that cross. I also gave you my website at the end. I talked about the proper way to render wires that cross and are also connected to each other. If they're not connected and they cross, generally they just cross. There's no dot. You can also, if they're not connected, use that little jog to indicate that they're not connected. One of them literally jumps over the other one, it kind of looks like. Or, or does it dip under? Depends on your perspective, I guess. But anyway, rarely will you see that. That is a no-no in schematic diagrams. To indicate wires that cross and are connected, you don't want to do that. You should do either this or this. This is the old-fashioned way. That's the way I've done it in uh, Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics. So I just wanted to clear that up. I don't use this old-fashioned way, even though I think it's probably a little better in the sense that it's less ambiguous. And here's an example. I just found one in, in um, this book. Figure 5-6A on page 92, right there. You see two wires that cross and are connected. Whereas over here you see two wires that cross and are not connected. So that's the distinction there. There's also just one other little caveat. I don't always practice exactly what I preach. Once in a great while in a schematic diagram, it actually makes more sense to run lines diagonally like this than straight up and down. Now, we could run them straight up and down, but it would actually look worse if we forced these uh, lines here to march like soldiers in formation. So once in a great while, and here's another example, page 120, figure 6-4, page 121, figure 6-5. This book, Reading Schematics and Drawing Schematics, has a spiral binding if you care to get the paper-bound edition, which I really would recommend if you're going to use it on your workbench, because it'll lay flat for you, no boot up, no battery, no viruses. You can spill your coffee on it and all it'll get is wet and stained. Not destroyed, like a computer might get. <clears throat> and if a piece of solder happens to fly onto it, uh, it'll maybe make a little scorch mark, but it won't destroy your screen. There's a cool figure. Even though you aren't going to see that very often anymore. Strobe light? How often have you seen a strobe light lately? Well, well anyway, that's just uh, neither here nor there. I'd like to introduce a couple more symbols here. And those symbols are all introduced in increasing order of sophistication and complexity in Chapter 3. And here we'll talk about inductors and, in particular, what kind of a core an inductor has. The basic symbol that I use for an inductor, one, two, three, four, like that, usually, or a coil like this, and this is the symbols that actually appear in the book. I believe there are five loops in the symbols in the book, like that. But what do those two little lines mean? Well, here's the deal. If you see an inductor symbol like either one of these, and there's no lines whatsoever, it's an air core inductor. If, on the other hand, you see an inductor symbol with dashed lines like this, it is a powdered iron core. And if you see an inductor
with solid lines like that, that is a solid iron core or laminated. Generally speaking, the least inductance for any given number of turns in a solenoidal coil results from an air core, somewhat more from a powdered iron core, and even more from a laminated or solid iron core. An electromagnet would have a symbol like that. It would be a solid iron core. So those are uh, the symbols for inductors, and the same sort of thing applies in the case of a transformer. This is a step-down transformer with an air core. There's one with a powdered iron core. And there's one with a solid or laminated iron core. I don't think you're ever going to find a perfectly solid iron core transformer. They laminate the iron That is to say, they glue a bunch of slabs together. The reason that they do that is to maximize the amount of inductance that you can get or the amount of coupling between the coils while at the same time preventing losses from what they call eddy currents, which would otherwise occur in this kind of a core, a solid iron core, you get uh, circulating currents in the core and it heats the core material up and that produces loss and reduces the efficiency of the transformer. If you laminate a bunch of slabs together, glue them so that the currents can't actually flow between them, that is to say the glue does not conduct, then you get lots less eddy currents. It tends to choke off those eddy currents. So those are just a few little tutorial uh, remarks in regards to the symbols for inductors and transformers, all of which you will find and a great deal more in the book Beginner's Guide to Reading Schematics and Drawing Them. Third edition published by McGraw-Hill, October 2013, edited by yours truly, who will now sign off. Until the next video, wish you best regards.